Next up, we have Dr. Phillips. Uh, she graduated first in her class in Te University of Texas, South, uh, sorry, UT Southwestern. Uh, she did her internal medicine and cardiology at Baylor University Medical Center at Dallas, and then uh, went to Mayo Clinic for additional year of adult congenital heart disease. Um, she has received multiple outstanding teacher and educator awards at Mayo Clinic. Researching her, I came across an interview that she did with uh, Dr. William Roberts and was published in the Baylor University uh, Medical Center Proceedings which I would encourage all of you to read because it is fascinating and inspiring. Her talk is on pulmonic stenosis and pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum. Thank you so much for that uh, too kind introduction. I'm very pleased to be here with you guys today. And much of what I'm going to discuss is really overlapped with some of what you've already heard today. So I'm gonna to try to hit the high points of clinically what we need to be thinking about, both on physical exam in terms of uh, intervention and evaluation of our patients. Um, so I have no uh, disclosures. So let's just start with pulmonary valve stenosis, a much simpler lesion than what we've heard about in the last two or three talks, but quite important to us and, and often something we will see in our adult patients. And just to kind of think about the natural history, uh, adding this lesion of pulmonary valve stenosis will increase RV afterload, which will cause progressive RV pressure hypertrophy. And we don't really like that. I mean, the RV is supposed to be a compliant, volume-sensitive chamber. So this becomes quite important to our adult patient population to get RV diastolic dysfunction from pressure hypertrophy. This does cause progressive RA enlargement. And over time, you can get RV systolic dysfunction, but this would be a very late finding in an untreated patient. So in contrast to this is not something that usually causes RV dilatation early on. It may cause that after the fourth or fifth decade. But if you're faced with a patient in clinic or in the echo lab that you think has pulmonary valve stenosis, but a large right ventricle, and they're young, 20, 30 years of age, you need to be looking for associated lesions like an atrial septal defect or something else that's causing a volume load. So early on, this should look like pressure hypertrophy, not dilatation. So patients are gonna to complain to us about decreased exercise capacity. They're not able to meet the demands of increased cardiac output. They may have right-sided heart failure symptoms, but this could be a very late finding. So we don't wanna say, well, you don't have significant disease if you're not having big elephant tree trunk legs. They can uh, very much complain about this. And many times patients will talk about more splanchnic congestion early before they talk about uh, lower extremity edema, so keep that in mind. And palpitations, also quite common. The RV and the RA don't like to be pressure overloaded, and it does promote palpitations often with exercise. So on physical exam, what you guys are gonna be looking for is a systolic murmur at the left upper sternal border increases with inspiration as we increase volume return back to the right heart. If the valve is pliable and doming, you're gonna hear this systolic ejection click, and that click is kind of important on exams, and we'll talk about one of the most common exam questions regarding that. The parasternal impulse will be prominent. This is a pressure-loaded ventricle, and just like we think about pressure load and non-compliance, an S4 can be audible. Uh, delayed P2, so we're taking it longer to push blood across this stenotic outflow, so the closure of that pulmonary valve is delayed, so the split is increased. That's gonna help you distinguish this from, say, aortic stenosis, because sometimes the murmurs are loud and it's all over the sternum and all over the precordium. This will help you out. You can also look at the jugular vein. So if the patient is in sinus rhythm and they're having a lot of non-compliance issues as they try to push blood into this non-compliant right ventricle, the A wave will get very prominent and you'll see that in your jugular veins. So just as a, a reminder, as we get worsening pulmonary valvular stenosis, a worsening gradient between the RV and the PA, we're gonna see uh, a lengthening of the murmur. So the murmur will be crescendo, decrescendo when it's uh, mild or moderate, but as we get to severe stenosis, you're just gonna have this crescendo component. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> 
So just to think about the exam for those of you uh, still in training, uh, trying to meet these COCAT requirements, we're gonna think about with inspiration that there's an S4 because of a stiff RV. This is if you're in sinus rhythm and your murmur is gonna extend past A2 and P2 is gonna be there. It may be very soft or difficult to hear. And then an expiration, uh, you're gonna have uh, an increased uh, murmur here uh, potentially from inspiration will be increased, decreased in uh, expiration. And then your ejection click, unlike every other sound in the right heart, is gonna get louder in expiration if it's there. So that's the board exam question. So remember these things for on the rounds, uh, on the wards, and on the boards. Uh, S4 is not audible if you're an AFib. There's no mechanical atrial activity, so don't get tripped up on that. The later the peak of the murmur, usually the more significant the stenosis. P2 can become very inaudible in uh, very stenotic valves. And the click, the only right sided sound that's going to decrease with inspiration, increase with expiration. Everything else is the opposite. So what do we expect in adults who are untreated? Well, they may get atrial arrhythmias from this right atrial dilatation. And so AFib is one of the most common atrial arrhythmias we would see in a 40, 50-year-old unrepaired severe PS. Ventricular arrhythmias are reported but are not that common. And then right heart failure, first diastolic heart failure, like a HEFPEF picture, uh, and then potentially systolic dysfunction. So the nice thing about pulmonary valvular stenosis is pulmonary balloon valvuloplasty, a very good intervention even into adulthood, unlike aortic valve stenosis where the valve starts to get calcified, thickened, and maybe not amenable to balloon valvuloplasty. Pulmonary valves uh, are very amenable for the most part. So class one indications uh, in the guidelines uh, would be asymptomatic patients with the domed valve, we think more like a more pliable valve, and a maximal gradient on echo greater than 60 or a mean gradient greater than 40, so that's asymptomatic. And symptomatic patients, you can drop that uh, requirement down to a mean gradient of 30 or more. So just remember that surgery is sometimes indicated. Uh, Often these lesions aren't just a simple valve, maybe it's a very dysplastic looking valve, a very complex outflow tract, maybe pretty narrow, or there's associated PR or other lesions you need to address. And those patients would uh, do best with surgery or maybe a combined approach, say an ASD closure with a device and pulmonary balloon valvuloplasty. One key component in all these patients with outflow tract obstruction, whether it's something complicated like tetralogy, something post-valvular, or something uh, like this, pretty simple valvular heart disease, as a consumer of the echo, please, please remember that tricuspid valve regurgitation velocities that are calculating pressures are calculating RV systolic pressures. We make the assumption that that's pulmonary systolic pressure only if there's no obstruction. So don't be reading through an echo report very fast and see a TR velocity of 4.5 and say the patient has pulmonary hypertension if they have pulmonary stenosis, because of course the RV pressure is greater in these patients, but that does not reflect pulmonary hypertension. So let's turn now to a little more complicated uh, issue, pulmonary atresia with intact septum. This is not uh, the brother or the stepbrother of uh, what you just heard about of uh, pulmonary atresia VSD. These are two very different entities, and I don't want you to confuse the two. We're apples and oranges talking about pulmonary atresia VSD, which is like the end spectrum of tetralogy of Fallot. Uh, pulmonary atresia intact septum is quite different, and so this embryologic defect probably occurs later, much later after conotruncal division, and there's complete septation, so we don't get that malalignment defect like in pulmonary atresia VSD. The pulmonary arteries are small, but they're almost always normally formed. We don't see these um, crazy pulmonary anatomies that we can see sometimes in pulmonary atresia with VSD. For the most part, in the patients with intact ventricular septum, the PDA supplies the PAs, and these MAPCAs that we heard about so nicely 
uh, visualized in the last talk are very rare. And uh, treatment really is quite complicated, uh, the treatment plan that we go through in pulmonary atresia intact septum, and it really depends on the anatomic features of the ventricle, where you can see that treatment in pulmonary atresia VSD really relied on what are the anatomic features of the PAs, how are we going to go and approach all of that. So this is pretty rare, um, 0.083 per 1,000 live births. Again, a slight male predominance. You're going to look for diminished RV forces and LVH on the chest on the EKG. And a chest X-ray usually is not going to have much cardiac enlargement, with the exception of this rare uh, malformed tricuspid valve that has a lot of regurgitation that can cause uh, enlargement of the right heart, which is unusual. Uh, so tricuspid valve anatomy is going to be super important in childhood in the pediatric groups deciding what they're going to do and how they're going to approach this patient. For us as adult congenital uh, providers, that decision's already going to be been made. They're going to come to us as with a, a terminal plan of action for how they're going to be repaired. But, but our colleagues are really looking at this Z-score, the tricuspid annulus. That's going to determine really how the RV is behaving, and it has a lot to do with if the RV has a dependent uh, the coronary flow is dependent on the RV, which we'll talk about. So what, I, what do I mean? What does the RV look like? We're really wondering, is the RV pretty normally formed with the three tripartite? Does it have an inflow, an outflow that's well formed, and a, and a, a, a septal branch? Is it there, and it's just with a small annulus that's imperforate valve? That's a whole different approach. This, this, this is a normal ventricle with a little outflow. That's very different than this guy. These are both pulmonary atresia with intact septum patients, but this is a very small tricuspid annulus. The, the ventricular anatomy does not look tripartite, and you have this uh, obliteration of the infundibulum with this thick muscular. These guys are usually in trouble and may not be able to go to a biventricular repair, most likely. So what is the management strategy briefly in childhood? Well, the first and foremost, you've got to maintain a source of pulmonary blood flow, just in like the other cases we heard about. And prostaglandins are important, and maybe now stenting of the duct to keep that flow open. Then you've got to make a decision if you're going to try to decompress the RV. Are you going to try to open the outflow in some way? And maybe that's if you have this uh, valve, this membrane that, membrane that you could perforate with radio frequency. Um, a catheter. Sometimes folks have talked about atrial septostomy, but you're not going to decompress the RV if you think the coronary flow was dependent on RV high pressure, and we'll get into that. Uh, we want to eventually provide a stable source of pulmonary blood flow. The team has to decide how to do that, and that may be some type of uh, shunting procedure, aortopulmonary shunt. And then you decide the path that you think the patient best can go down. Can they have a two-ventricle repair? Do they need one-and-a-half ventricle? Do they need a Glenn plus an open outflow? Or do they need a Fontan? Or should we just leave them with like a BT shunt? That's relatively rare. So these paths have already been picked by the time they come to us in adult congenital heart disease clinic. Um, but this coronary anatomy is critical. I want you to understand this uh, fact about why some patients are not decompressed. So RV to coronary fistula are common in this condition, and that's you know, maybe up to 70% of the cases or so. And these are embryologic channels that persist connecting the RV cavity to the coronary tree because of this high RV pressure that forces blood into them. But that doesn't mean the anatomy or the coronary flow is dependent on the RV pressure. So, but what if the coronary anatomy is really abnormal, that from the aorta to the coronary tree, there's obstructions, uh, maybe even atresia of the coronary connection to the aorta? Well, then the coronary blood flow is dependent on that high pressure in the RV to push blood into, through these sinusoids, into these fistulae, into the coronary arteries. And those are the patients that you don't want to decompress. You drop the high RV pressure, and they're not going to perfuse their coronary. So those patients need to go to a single ventricle 
approach. So what happens for us adults who, we're, this is what we're seeing, the patient's already been chosen a pathway, they're either a biventricular one and a half or a FONTAM for the most part. What do they look like in adulthood? And we do have a, a small series at the Mayo Clinic, uh, 20 adult patients that we found in our clinic with pulmonary atresia intact septum that we followed uh, from 1998. We picked them up in clinic in that time period. All patients had initially been given some type of aorto to pulmonary shunt for their blood flow. And then their median age of when we saw them um, was 29 years. There was five deaths in the group at an age of 32 years. And you see that most patients had a biventricular uh, repair, uh, but quite a few have a univentricular approach. They all needed us to do something more for them in adulthood. So they did not escape with their initial repair or initial palliation strategy and not need more help. So they needed more procedures and one poor patient had seven procedures and many of these procedures involved repair or replacement of the tricuspid valve or intervention on your RV outflow tract. That makes sense, though some patients actually needed mitral evaluation and repair. Arrhythmia is very common, both atrial, most likely, but even ventricular arrhythmias. So this patient population, while they can do well and live into adulthood, they have a lot of morbidity that we need to be able to address, and they're going to need ongoing evaluation in a specialized center. Anticoagulation looked important in this group. So in summary, PAIVS, in distinction to pulmonary atresia ven Tricular septal defect. This is a wide spectrum of RV and tricuspid valve morphology. You've got to be paying attention to how are the coronaries formed, how's the RV, how's the tricuspid valve to make your management strategy. And post that, we're going to be tasked with taking care of their arrhythmias and their comorbid valvular disease. Thanks for your attention.